Welcome in to AWA Unleashed. Uh, we celebrate the memories and the stories of the American Wrestling Association. And one of the things that we do is we really want to paint everything in a positive light here. If you, if you guys have, you know, heard the podcast, uh, you know that we do cover everything. We've talked about the early, the middle, the late, the good, the bad. And today um, we are going to pay homage to someone that we lost uh, last Thursday morning. Um, Sodbuster Kenny J, the very capable uh, Kenny Sodbuster J. Um, he uh, passed away at the age of, of 85. So if you tuned in and you were expecting John Nord part two, uh, we actually pushed it back uh, a week because we felt like it was the proper thing is to pay respect to one of the most probably likable individuals that we have that, I mean, you just, you see it all over and let me go ahead and bring in uh, Joe Chupik and Mick Karch and safe to say guys, that I think since we found out about Kenny's unfortunate passing, you just see all of this uh, respect and admiration and it's, it's great to see, but at the same time, it's always very heartbreaking as well when you see like somebody was so beloved and you hear about it and unfortunately he's not able to experience it. So what, what I want to do is I feel like it's the best is to just tell the stories of, of Kenny J and not just the wrestler, but I think the individual as well, because there's a, a, a lot of stories and a lot of things that can be told. Well, you know, I, I told you and Joe before we went on the air here, this is this is really a uh, it's not even bittersweet isn't the word for it. This is this is uh, an episode that I have um, looked forward to doing on the basis of what we're going to be doing. But then the flip side of that is the reason that we're doing it uh, sucks. And, you know, it, it, it's interesting I'm thinking back, I've known Kenny J, my God, probably 50 years. And it's it, it, it's about the wrestling business itself. You know, you, you don't see somebody for a while and then you, you reunite with them and you kind of pick right up where you left off. And that was always the case with Kenny J. And it's really odd because I, I think to myself, I'm not going to see Kenny anymore. And that makes absolutely no fucking sense to me. Um, you know, I saw Kenny, we all did, at the uh, AWA reunion last October. And what was interesting about it was when we started to put out the feelers, and Chris, you're well aware of this, of the, the people that we would like to have attended the, the reunion. Kenny J was the first one to say, yeah, I'm going to be there. Yes. And yes. Kenny, at 85 years old and in failing health, uh, because it's been a rough year or so for Kenny, he didn't hesitate. Boom, I'm going to be there. And uh, that was always so typical of Kenny J. And my God, you know, you, you don't think. And he looked pretty good to me at the reunion. He, yeah, you know, he, he, he did. Was, he did, yeah. He was, he was in great spirits. When was Kenny not in great spirits? I, I should say that. And... Uh, and then all of a sudden, you know, the other day, I get the text from uh, from his daughter, and his dad passed away last night. And it's like, you got to be kidding me. You know, this is, I, I mean, literally all the blood rushed to my toes. I was just like, not Kenny J. Um, I know it's part of life, et cetera, et cetera. And, and for those around the country who might not be familiar with Kenny J., uh, and are wondering, well, why are you guys paying such homage to this guy? You're going to know by the end of this 45 minutes or an hour exactly why. Well said, Mick. I, like any death that happens uh, in our industry of our childhood heroes, um, and I'll include Kenny J into that. Kenny J was 
a big integral part of my watching the AWA, even though, even though you knew that Kenny J was going against Super Destroyer Mark II or, or Nick Bockwinkle, whomever it was, you knew that Kenny J was going to lose. Um, as a kid, you didn't want to be Kenny J. As an adult, <laughs> getting to know Kenny J, um, working with him, uh, going to his annual histiocytosis fundraiser for his grandson, uh, watching him at the different indies uh, around the Twin Cities, uh, engaging with the fans and loving to engage with the fans. Um, all of that is now gone, at least from a going forward standpoint. But thankfully, got it right here mm -hmm. and got it right here. So for you, Sodbuster, for you, Kenny J. Uh, yeah. That's well, and, and I think, Joe, to, to kind of piggyback off of your thoughts, when you're seeing him uh, and you know that he's probably going to lose, but you get so attached to him because that's when you feel the story. That's when you feel, hey, I really want this guy to win. I, I mean, we'll talk about maybe the biggest win in his entire career a little bit later on, but you just, you feel this attachment and that attachment as a kid, I get the sense you guys, and, and maybe I'm wrong because I, you know, didn't see that. I can only go off the stories and, you know, what I see in here now, but I feel like the attachment that people had to him as a wrestler when they were kids, as you get older, the attachment went from, you know, wanting to root for him as the wrestler to enjoying him more as the person. Here's one of the things that I can say about seeing him uh, being the enhancement talent, being the jobber, however you want to use it. Mm -hmm. Kenny would, you, you knew that Kenny was at the top of the jobber list back in the day, because when he was in a match, in a TV match, he would always have a great comeback. And there was always that, that, for that second, and again, as a little kid, it's like, oh my God, is Ken, is, is this going to be it? Is Kenny J finally going to win a match? You know, all, all of this, and then alas, no, you know, it, it didn't happen. But there was something special, and I'm not just saying this about Kenny because he just passed, but there was something special, and I knew it as a kid. He was a a special jobber. He was a special guy who lost each and every week. And I'm just thankful that in my later years that I was able to, to get that sense, to get that feeling and to get to know that what I had bought as a kid was a reality. And that was that Kenny J was, he was just one hell of a guy. The, the interesting thing about uh, Kenny J as opposed to the rest of the enhancement talent, you know, they build Kenny J out of Cleveland, Ohio, and we've talked about this before. I don't know if Marty O'Neill came up with that, if Wally Carbo came up. I, I don't know. But, you know, Kenny once told me, he said, I don't know where they got that. He says, I remember flying over Cleveland or I remember, you know, be having a layover at the Cleveland airport one time. He says, but, you know. <laughs> I'm a Bloomington guy. And what was lovable about Kenny J in, in the role that we saw him here in the AWA, he was our guy. You know, a lot of the, you know, enhancement guys would come in and then they'd leave town. Maybe they come in every, you know, couple of months or once a year or whatever. But Kenny was always there. And you could bill him from Cleveland. You could bill him from Malibu. You could bill him from, you know, Mount Kilimanjaro. He was our Kenny J. And you, you talked about the enthusiasm. Maybe Kenny has a shot, you know, of, of beating this guy, whatever. Part of that was because the AWA, every once in a while, 
would put Kenny in a situation where he got an upset victory, where most of the enhancement guys never experienced that. Uh, Kenny did. And like you said, Joe, you know, he, he had that fire, and you always knew. And I told Kenny, I said, my God, Kenny, you have run into more knees and elbows than an orthopedic <laughs> surgeon. And, uh, and and that's uh, and he loved it. He loved his role as a, as an enhancement guy. He made everybody look great. Um, you know, we're, we're going to talk more about that. Some quotes from some very famous individuals that will put Kenny J over from a, a personal in ring standpoint. Um, but again, the, the finality of death sucks. I mean, like like you say, Joe, in terms of going forward and knowing that the, the histiocytosis benefits are, are a thing of the past or that, you know, Kenny's not going to be appearing at any indie show, signing autographs with that sodbuster Kenny J t-shirt. My God, he loved it and the people loved him. It's a tough pill to swallow, but uh, I will say, and I've said before, and we're going to bring a guest on here in a minute who knew Kenny J. Kenny from a, a family standpoint there is there has not been a nicer genuine more down-to-earth compassionate individual that I have ever met in the wrestling business other than Kenny J I mean he was absolutely it and uh to say he's going to be missed is is uh probably the understatement of the year well, along those lines, Mick, uh, we've talked a couple of times now about the annual benefit for histiocytosis. And uh, in, in the beginning, I shouldn't say just in the beginning, but more so in the beginning, it was truly a fundraiser for his grandson uh, yeah. for, for, the, for histiocytosis. But it evolved. It, it always was still about the benefit, but it evolved into, in my opinion, that became an annual AWA reunion. Absolutely. You had, you had guys, you had Red Bastine, you had Dr. X, Nick Bockwinkle, um, the High Flyers, Larry the X, Henning Baron. They would all show up to this every year at the American Legion down in Savage and sign autographs, uh, auction stuff off, sing, do, do whatever. But they did that because of Kenny J, because of the respect that they had for Kenny and the love that they had for Kenny J. Um, and again, it, those days are are, are gone uh, with with Kenny's passing. But um, you know, hey, also, the best we can do is carry on. And today we will carry on with the <laughs> a lot of memories of the Sodbuster. And with that, uh, one of the memories of the Sodbuster is a feud that uh, I was fortunate enough to uh, do some play-by-play -play for back in the 1990s. And the feud that Kenny had was on the independent circuit with that guy, that guy right there. Oh, don't, no, no, don't gimmick infringement. <laughs> Wait, what? Are, is I JD heard. muted? Am I muted? There you go. All right. I JB, have the right to do that. JB Trask, ladies and gentlemen, uh, JB and I have known each other for 30 plus years. Yes. And JB is actually the nephew of Sodbuster Kenny J. So JB can has I, had I, really. Can pardon I make me? a couple corrections before I forget? Because I'm yeah, sure sure. my memory's not good. Um, just, I'm going to beg to differ on a couple points that you guys made, especially Joe. Um, first of all, he said that you knew Kenny was going to lose when you watched him on TV. And you know what, Joe? I think Vern gave Kenny just the right amount of three or four wins that yep. a true AWA fan thought there is a chance. There's hope. There is a chance. Even though it didn't, there was always a chance. And the second point I want to make, as Joe said, as a kid, you never wanted to be Kenny J. Um, I beg to differ. <laughs> Ken Burbeck said that him and his brother 
whenever they would goof around and wrestle, one would be Kenny J and the other would be George Scrap Iron Kadaski. So I, I just had it. to prove you wrong, Joe. That's all right. If, if you hadn't have done it, I know somebody who would have. But <laughs> you know, hey, JB, mean, JB, I will give you both of those. My my reply still stands, and of course, it's completely in love and respect for. Oh me. yeah, I know, I know. JB, um, I, I mentioned the feud that you had with with Kenny J and the Northern Premier Wrestling promotion, but of course, that was you know well into your stint as a wrestler and, and uh right. kenny of course had been in the business for 25 years by then but talk about uh, the relationship with kenny growing up i know he was your dad's brother yeah. and uh just talk about the history a little bit when did you first get the get the the idea hey this guy is a wrestler on tv he's just not just my uncle kenny um <laughs> well, this, you know, first of all, when you, when you, uh, messaged me and wanted me to be on here and you said, yeah, can you come and talk for about five or 10 minutes? I thought, holy cow, Mick, you're talking about a man who's been in the business for 50 years and his nephew who was involved in the business for 30. And you want me to wrap this up in 10 minutes? Well, That's it's only crazy. because it's because it's you, JB. Yes, Anybody exactly. else, I would have said, you know, give take me, the whole hour. Give me the shaft again. <laughs> Yes, what? Kenny. Kenny. Kenny was my dad's brother, my dad's younger brother. Um, we all grew up in Bloomington. Kenny lived a mile and a half away. I used to ride my bike over there to play with his son Tim. We all know Tim J. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we grew up in the landscaping business, and I, it's just something we knew. Kenny was was a pro wrestler and. Me and Tim would always go to the TV studios with Kenny. And there's a lot of lot of old footage. And if you look like, I believe it's the back left-hand corner, there's probably two little kids there, and that's me and Tim wow. there all the time. And then every Thanksgiving was, hurry up and eat Thanksgiving because Uncle Kenny's coming to pick you up, John, and, and go, you know, go to the wrestling. And we'd go to the auditorium or the Civic Center, me and Tim and Kenny, and every Christmas, same thing. So it was, it was, I was born wanting to be a wrestler. You know, it was about, I think when I ran MPW, my mom out of the blue pulls out this drawing I made when I was in third grade of me in the wrestling ring. Wow. So I, I, I thought that, yeah, I've wanted to be a wrestler my whole life. So that's actually where I started wanting to be a wrestler. My dad, not so much, wanted me to be a wrestler because he knew the bumps and bruises Kenny went through and the hardships and stuff. And he even had, we we did a sod job for Nick Bockwinkle. And I don't, I can't, I can't remember how, I must have been nine or 10. And my dad just out of the blue goes, yeah, Nick, so my son here, he wants to be a pro wrestler. Why don't you talk to him about that? So Nick spent 20 minutes telling me how bad of an occupation being a pro wrestler was, but that didn't stop me. That just wanted me to do it more. You know? Well, hold least, on, hold on. Nick was honest minutes. with you. <laughs> what? Yeah, tw 20 minutes? That is the shortest conversation it that is. I've ever had with Nick. Well, Fox. I had to get back to sod in his yard, so. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, we, we were, uh, Dan Kenny, you know, their company was landscaping and hauling hay, hauling straw. Vern had horses. So every once in a while, we'd be hauling some hay to, to Vern's place in Mound. And it was always me and me and Tim were like, is he going to have the ring set up? Is he going to? And then if the ring was set up, Kenny would go in the ring with us and, and let us go at it and bounce around in the ring and, and wrestle and um then then as we got older actually it was finally me and tim decided to confront kenny and i can't remember it must have been 15 14 something like that we said please train us so kenny goes all right let's go in the backyard it's like what he goes yep let's go ahead. and the first thing i had to do was learn how to fall so he says all right fall down it's like what this is grass. I don't care what it is. You fall down. 
So me and Tim took our first bumps on his lawn, and that's where we started training right there. And then from there, it just trained a little bit in Vern's ring when we had a chance and some other training. And then, uh, oh, here's a good memory. <laughs> <coughs> we, uh, I, can't, I can't, Vern had a place out in Chanhassen. Yeah. A yeah. big barn, and it was a rental place. And I can't remember what we were there for. We were there with Kenny, and we opened up this barn, and it was just like a museum of wrestling rings. There was so many damn wrestling rings in there. And I was like, Kenny, you think you could talk to Vern and, and see if we could find one good ring and, and get it? And so we, because we wanted to set it up ourselves. And Kenny finally talked to Vern and Vern says, take whatever you want out of there. Wow. Well, we weren't greedy people. So we just got one complete ring and that's good enough. And and that was my very first ring. We set it up in my brother's yard and and did some training over there too. And that was I was getting older and closer. And and um, Joe Laurinaitis came over and trained with us. T. Joe Khan, they they knew we had a ring, so they came over too. And then Kenny would come over and and I mean I never had one set formal training like training school. Mine was just a lifetime of training and a lifetime of smarts. Let's uh, let's fast forward to <laughs> the feud that you had with Kenny. Yep. Uh, with your uncle Kenny. And for those unaware, you know, JB has referenced Northern Premier Wrestling. That was JB's company back in the 90s. And you came up with a storyline that was just terrific. I love that. Yeah, I love that story. Well, I, I went with a different name because uh, Kenny's son deserved to be, he was Tim J and he was doing some wrestling, not a whole lot, but a little bit. And he deserved the right to have the name Tim J. So I wanted to go with my own character, my own self and be my own person. And so I, I did that for almost eight, nine years before we got MPW going. So then, you know, the, the start of it was to have this, we were going ex, we to expose that I was Kenny's nephew, but I didn't want it exposed. That was, that was the main storyline. And we started in St. Joe, Minnesota, which was great because that's Kenny's neck of the woods, the St. Cloud, Avon, that area. So we had a battle royal on MPW, and I was going to dive into the corner and the guy was going to move and I hit my head on the, and I was just going to lay there and Kenny was going to continue the battle royal, but kind of look like, you know, and start to get this worried expression on his face. And my dad was part of the company too. He did the ring setup and stuff. And so I went and I hit that post and I just laid there. I was like a wet noodle and everything was going good. And then all of a sudden my dad comes over and Kenny comes over and they start carrying me to the back room and I was just unconscious and this is kind of fine. I don't think you even know this part, Mick. The minute that locker room door closed, I stood up and went, that was great. And my dad <laughs> looked at me and he goes, you son of a bitch. And I'm like, what? He goes, I thought you were seriously hurt. And I go, oh, I forgot to tell my dad. <laughs> so he was what? all worried. But then after that, the end of the show, what we had is Kenny went and did an interview because Mick was confused as to why Kenny was so concerned about J.B. Trask because I was one, I mean, it was my promotion, but I was on the top heels in the area. Let's, I mean, let's say it truthfully. <laughs> yeah, I like that face, Mick. So Kenny's out there and and then I come staggering out and I'm I'm all sore and everything and and then Kenny goes and exposes that I'm his nephew and I get mad and I beat the crap out of him there on stage. And that started the feud. We only had a two match feud, didn't we, Mick? Yeah, that was it. It was, yeah. a two -match, but it, boy, was it over. It was all know? built up to be, to come on uh, down in Mankato and tapes rolling channel two yep. decided they were going to film Northern premier wrestling and, and film wrestling and they use that whole thing as their basis for their show 
And boy, it came out great. Absolutely great. It, it, it truly did. And two things that were going for that feud. Number one was you were a hell of a heel. I'll, I'll, you know, give you your due oh, there. Thanks. The other part was how beloved Kenny was. Oh, yes. You know, yes. so when you turned on your, you know, not only did you turn on Kenny J, you turned on family, you son of a bitch. I know. I mean, you you just went right right yeah you made Dominic Mysterio look like child's play uh, yeah uh, went right for the juggler absolutely but it, but it was so great and and what I loved about that was the enthusiasm that Kenny had because yeah. Kenny was now part of a main event program right you know periodically you know as we say or as you said Vern would toss him a bone a little bit you know give him a little bit of shine. But this gave Kenny an opportunity to be the headliner. And the two of you worked like magic. And I just remember thinking, watching Kenny come into the building with his duffel bag and how everybody greeted yeah. him. And go get him, Kenny. Go right. get him tonight, Kenny. And they, it wanted, was, they wanted my ass beat. Oh, bad. they did. It, it, look at Look at him. Look at him. There he is, ladies and gentlemen. That's There's, the superior male days. The superior male JB yeah. Trash. I mean, you can see why the people hated you. I oh, mean, yeah. just by that picture alone, you know. Yeah, exactly. Oh, so so that was uh, just a great, great era. I got to tell you something though. It's I, and I don't know why, but I've wrestled almost every AWA guy out there. I've done something. Baron, Ray Stevens, uh, Greg Gagne did a little thing with him did a thing with Nick Bockwinkle and every one of these guys were just like a feather. It's just beautiful. So I thought, Kenny, beautiful. Kenny was the stiffest son of a bitch I ever met in my life. You know why? Cause I was his nephew. Absolutely. Everybody else that worked with him, he was like light, but no, he, he took it out on me. JB, it might as well have been the green grass in the backyard. It, 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 exactly. Oh, it's, absolutely. Uh, Take well, a that, backdrop you know, in the backyard. That that is that's just great. And you know, we're gonna have you on absolutely. We've talked about this about having you on to do your, you know, your own show down the road here. And so much to talk about. But as we wrap up with you, being Kenny J's nephew. I mean, you saw kind of the deterioration a little bit in Kenny's health yeah. over the past couple of years. Basic question for you. How are you doing with this? I mean, this is not only part of your family, part of your childhood. Right. But going forward, life without Kenny J is going to be a little different. It's good. Yeah, it's really. T and, and like you guys were saying in the beginning, you know, you're like you remember him vibrant and energetic and. And when I first got the text, my first thought was, well, what the hell happened? Yeah, yeah. But then reality sets in. You're like, oh, yeah, he was 85. He was having trouble breathing. And then you start realizing, okay, well, yeah, it's it wasn't just some out of the blue thing that happened. So he lived a grand life. Oh, he did. Um, he was a he was a great guy. Um he gave so much to everybody and he could have the worst day in the world. And somebody would come by and go, Kenny, how are you doing? He's like, I'm doing good. You know? And he was, he was always the thumbs up, always the thumbs up. So, you know, it's, it's hard, it's surreal, you know, but um, we do, like Joe said, we have his memories. We have them here. And one of the greatest guys in the wrestling that, that ever lived, you know, no question about it. And, and JB, as I said, we're going to have you on again. We're going to, we got a lot to talk about with you and uh, thank you for sharing the memories. And again, you know, the, the mid nineties, uh, that time frame in NPW was great. It was a lot of yeah. fun and the Kenny J JB Trask feud. That was pretty damn good stuff. So, yes. Yeah. That was so, that, that was good stuff. That was fun. Don't forget uh, his celebration of life down at the Savage yes. Legion. That's going to be a that's going to be a big time a party in, in favor of Kenny and celebration of his life. It's going to be good. 
It absolutely. I will see you there, JB. Yeah, we'll see you there, Joe. Take care of yourself, JB. See you all soon. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank you. All right, ladies and gentlemen, J.B. Trask, the nephew of Kenny Sodbuster, J. Um, great stories. And and uh, one thing I was going to mention, and this is Kenny J. This is Kenny J. through and through. Uh, the feud that J.B. And, and Kenny had, there was one point where, where Kenny was being attended to by, I don't know, physicians or ringside doctors or the popcorn vendor or whoever might have come over to help Kenny after J.B. laid him out. And Kenny's laying on the floor there, and of course, you know, the the play-by-play uh, -play guy is so concerned, he wants to go over there and he wants to check on Kenny as well. Well, Kenny, you know, he wasn't exactly a muscle man. I mean, Kenny was, you know, he Kenny was, was Kenny physique-wise. And I leaned over and I whispered to Kenny, I said, my God, you look like a harpooned whale. And Kenny J, who, of course, was in a state of unconsciousness at that point, says, you dirty son of a bitch. <laughs> <laughs> there, there's our friend Kenny. Uh, that shot is from the French Lake Wrestling Association, where Kenny uh, made a lot of appearances. And, you know, I, I look at that picture, Joe, and I, I, again, it's mind boggling. You know, to, to realize, I mean, that, that's Kenny. He's like right in your living room and we're not going to see him again. No, um, it, it's always tough when it first happens. And, and I mean, it's been a few days right now, but talking about Kenny, having JB on and so forth, just all of those, all of the memories from, as I had alluded to earlier, from watching Kenny, yes, mainly lose on television, to working with him, seeing him at, at all of these indie shows and every single time, a fan would come up to him. He was gracious. He was happy. He was smiling that they still wanted to talk to Kenny J to have a picture taken with the sodbuster, the very capable Kenny J. Um, I've, I've got friends that have been long time, uh, long time friends who've been long time wrestling fans. Uh, in fact, I gave uh, one of them a shout out last week, Jeff Bikestead. Um, but I texted this group, um, Tony Dema and Todd Peterson were, were included in there. And the text just started flying back and forth about how great, what kind of a guy that Kenny J was. They, every time they would see him at the show, they would immediately go up to him to say hi, to get yet another picture with the sod buster. And that's just who Kenny was. And let, let's not forget. Um, he may have lost often in the ring, but I've heard that he was a pretty damn good athlete back in his day as well. So give him the credit. And to even be a jobber and lose in the ring from the large majority of guys, you do do you do need to be an athlete, period. What what was your first let me kind of go back here, guys. You know, Joe, you said that he was, you know, not there when you were in the AWA. But I want to ask both of you guys, uh, let's start with you, Mick. What was your first interaction like when you met Kenny? I didn't actually, well, I had seen Kenny wrestling going back to the 1960s when I was going to the TV studios. Kenny was already, you know, wrestling there. Looked a lot different than uh, than the Kenny J in, in later years. I didn't start talking to in interacting with Kenny until about the 1970s. About the same time, I, I had the same kind of a relationship with George Gadaski. Uh, so the, the two of them both were such great guys. And I just remember how down to earth Kenny J was right from the very beginning. You know, and, and like, like Joe and, and JB have said, Kenny J could be having the worst day in the world and he could be crippled up from a match or whatever. But if you asked him how he was doing, Kenny, how's it going? Hey, I'm doing great. And and that was the attitude. And that's why uh, Kenny had the longevity in the business that he did. Um, it has been said, and I will verify this for all the eons that I've been a part of this, nobody I have ever heard of 
that has interacted with Kenny J has had a bad thing to say about him. Uh, you know, in this business, there's a lot of, you know, <laughs> backstabbing, a lot of heat, a lot of jealousy, a lot of uh, pecking order stuff. But when it came to Kenny J, everybody, everybody loved Kenny J. Uh, not only because he was such a genuine person, but because he made everybody look so damn good in the ring. And Vern rewarded his loyalty on a couple of occasions uh, with some high-profile stuff. Um, but we'll get into that mm -hmm. in just a second. Yeah, that's one thing that we're going to bring up a, a little bit later on when we kind of wrap it up. And, and you'll hear how one of the legends, one of the all-time greats that even casual wrestling fans will recognize, you realize how highly he was thought of by a lot of the people in the ring. Um, I, I, I guess when I, I want to ask you kind of, Joe, when you were, you know, when you met Kenny, was it kind of the same impression that you, you, you know, you kind of get the same sense that he was, you know, he was who you thought he was kind of to quote Denny Green. Without a doubt, the first time that I met Kenny was at uh, one of the histiocytosis benefits for his grandson. Uh, went up, uh, introduced myself, told him that I did uh, Vern's TV for a while, but that uh, Kenny was gone by then. Uh, but didn't think anything of it. Um, I didn't think anything of it where, yeah, this, you know, Kenny's not going to remember me. Well, I came back next year and the year after that, ran into him several times at different uh, uh, local indie shows. And I'd go up to Kenny and most every time, most every time he would remember me as Polish Joe. The couple of times that he didn't would have been a little bit later on. But hell, I'm 57 <laughs> years old and there's times where I can't remember your name. Um, Jack, or I mean, Chris Tubbs, uh, but no, <laughs> gracious, gracious, smiles, um, love the fans, loved whatever adoration that he would get from whatever the situation was, Kenny ate it up. And I don't want to say spit it out, but it mm -hmm. went into him and it came out with smiles and love for the fans. What kind of relationship did he have with the boys, Mick, that, that you could tell? Because, you know, we know sometimes there's jealousy. If you get a certain spot and, you know, this is going to be mine and I'm going to be given that rub or, you know, however we want to say, there can be some of that professional jealousy. Like what was his relationship like with the rest of the locker room? You got to remember, you're in a different era, first of all, Chris, um, where the enhancement guys would come in and they would do their job on television, put the put the stars over. So it's not like it is today where every match has to be a main event caliber, you know, and you get 10 minutes of wrestling, you know, on a, on a two hour show. So, you know, a, a star would come in or if they lived here, you know, there's Kenny and Jake Milliman. I love that picture. Two of the most beloved uh, enhancement guys, personalities, whatever you want to say uh, in, in AWA history. But I know for a fact when they knew they were getting in the ring with Kenny J, there was there was not going to be any any screw ups. There was not going to be any. You know, try to get himself over at their expense, making them look bad. They knew they were in the ring with a professional. And if somebody came in from out of town and they heard about Kenny J, if a guy was coming into the territory for the first time and he was going to you know, appear on television and he heard he was going to be wrestling with Kenny J, he was all good. I love this picture. Uh, that's Kenny in the front row there, second from the left, along with Nick Bockwinkel. That photograph was taken in 1992. Uh, Dr. X was coming into town. It was uh, He was coming in for the Super Bowl, uh, Buffalo and Washington. 
And Dr. X, of course, from Buffalo, New York. So the Iron Duke, Jim Mitchell, who was the second guy from the right on the in the top row, uh, put on a little party for Dr. X. And so many of the AWA guys were there, including Kenny. And Kenny just had a blast. Um, you know, we're kind of all over the board here because the memories – they keep coming in, you know, it, it, it's like, yeah. you know, you get this, uh, this slingshot effect of memories about Kenny J. I, as far as the histiocytosis is concerned, and, and Joe knows this very well, Kenny was so tireless when he would put this event on. And literally the reason that he stopped doing the events, he told me, he said, I'm tired. I would do this forever if I could, but it's so hard. You know, it's such a labor of love. And Kenny would get the guys in from all over the country, not only the upper Midwest, and he would put this all together by himself. He would he would call me two months ahead of time and give me the date for the histiocytosis. I'm going to send you a poster. Can you put the poster up on your on your Internet site? I said, yeah, Kenny, we'll do that for you. Um <laughs> He, he almost single-handedly put this event together. And this was no extravagant event. This is a bunch of wrestling fans and wrestlers getting together at an American Legion or a VFW and having beer and brats and, you know, uh, auctions and whatever else. And they did it because they love Kenny J. Dr. X mm -hmm. would come in from Buffalo, New York on his own dime almost every year because it was Kenny J. Uh, Red Bastine would come in. Nick Bockwinkle would come in from Las Vegas. Uh, the local guys, Baron Von Raschke, uh, Eddie Sharkey, Steve Olsonowski, Stan Kowalski, the Baron. Everybody did it on their own dime. Nobody was making any money. All the funds went to the histiocytosis research. And uh, that is the measure of the man Kenny J and and Joe, we saw him at these events running around, glad handing everybody, and and it was just wonderful to see. I I don't know what I can add on to that. I I honestly don't because you hit it right on the head, Mick. The boys came in for Kenny J. It's respect, the, and that that's it's hard to get that kind of respect from everybody from the top. All the way to the bottom, like it's it seemed like there wasn't anybody. The impression I'm getting anyway is that there wasn't anybody who wouldn't step up for Kenny J if he needed it. Exactly. When I got the word, um, when when Mick messaged us about Kenny's passing, um, I, I called Baron and uh and Greg Ganya right away, and both of them said immediately that I've got to contact the family and that they would be at um at Kenny's tribute. Not one, and, and hey, let's face it, Mick, we, we know people in this business where uh, if they passed, it'd be may, maybe yeah. in the back of their heads that, you know, they're, they're, they, they want to say, oh, good, it's about time. Not going to, you know, but for Kenny J, it was genuine. It, 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 it is genuine mm -hmm. from, from Baron to Greg to the three of us here and to, Anybody that ever came across Kenny J, the, the man, he, he is a legend. He, he is a wrestling legend yes. in the AWA. He might have, probably has one of the greatest losing records in the business, but you know what? He won over the fans mm -hmm. of the AWA over the course of his career. He sure did. And uh, we're going to talk about some of the highlights of uh, Kenny J's career. No, ladies and gentlemen, he didn't lose every match. That is no. not true. Um, we're going to talk about a couple of things. And I know one famous boxing match that we should uh, allude to here uh, was in 1976, I believe. And Muhammad Ali was going to be having this infamous boxer versus wrestler match with Antonio Inoki in Japan. Well, the match itself, that match was a fiasco. It was just terrible. And anybody who knows about it 
knows that Anoki basically laid on his back and, and kind of in crab position and was kicking it. I'll leave for 15 rounds. But as a hype for that, on ABC's Why World of Sports, they brought in Kenny J and Buddy Wolf to uh, to box Muhammad Ali, little sparring sessions, the boxer versus wrestler. And, of course, Kenny went in against Muhammad Ali and uh, did the job, as they say, uh, made Ali look good. And what was interesting about that, I mean, Kenny got worldwide notoriety for that appearance. And, of course, Howard Cosell is basically blasting it uh, on television as he's doing commentary. That might be the shot right there or, you know, the, the near shot that, that uh, KO'd Kenny. They, they finally called the match. And Kenny confided in me on many occasions over the years. They told him specifically, don't hurt Muhammad. You know, you can go in there, you can maybe grab a hold once in a while, but this is how it's going to go down, and you're going to go down. <laughs> I believe it was uh, round two. And Kenny said, "I could, he was a great athlete, but I could have stretched that son of a bitch anytime I wanted to, but they told me don't hurt Muhammad. And uh, I, I don't know what they paid Kenny for the appearance, probably not very much. But Kenny said, if I would have hurt him, if I would have, you know, twisted his arm the wrong way, I probably would have never worked in the business again. So, uh, you know, that was uh, an infamous uh, Kenny J moment. I mean, any, 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 any idea how he got that? Or, I mean, it, it seems so random that you would pick Kenny J to work with Muhammad Ali. Like, I mean, one of the, the biggest athletes on the planet. If you think about it, you had two guys. You had Buddy Wolf, who had, who was an established professional, had a great amateur wrestling background. So that's one spectrum. He goes in there, and he looked worse against Kenny J, I think, than, than, uh, or against Muhammad than Kenny did. The other thing is, it's testimony to Kenny J. Vern was involved in this, and he had all this roster of guys that he could have brought in. He could have brought in Gadaski. He could have brought in anybody, any number of guys to fight Muhammad Ali, but out of respect and because he knew Kenny would follow instruction, Kenny would be a professional, he gave Kenny the shine. And I, I think that that speaks volumes. Well, <clears throat> I, I would probably add to that, that Vern didn't want one of his – uh, somebody off of his roster to lose on wide world of sports. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, but I will say that's not the only reason, you know, Mick, you alluded to it earlier. This was not just Vern making sure that one of, uh, one of his, somebody off of his roster was going to made look bad on wide world of sports. He went with Kenny J and Kenny who, well, I've alluded to many times, lost more often than he didn't. But it was Vern paying back Kenny for his loyalty, for being a great worker in the business. And by a great worker, <laughs> you know, like working with a feather. Um, Kenny deserved that shot, all things considered. And... I mean, think about it. For for those that that weren't alive uh, when this match happened, 1976 ABC Wide World of Sports was huge. Yeah. This mm -hmm. was back in the day where yeah. you had four channels to choose from. Every this Saturday this was afternoon. It. This was this was oh, it. Th th this was it. Professional wrestling was not national. It was regionalized. Mm -hmm. Kenny J got thrust upon. Not a, not only North America, but the world, wherever ABC Wide World Sports may have been, Kenny J did it first. He, did did he, he ever did, did he ever talk years. about that? I mean, how did he feel about being in that spot? Did did you guys ever like talk to him about it? Absolutely. He was you know he was humble about it. You know when you talk to Kenny about it. It was just one of those things, you know, he would kind of joke about it. Yeah, I had that chance. Yeah, it was fun, blah, blah. But he he didn't gloat about it. And 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 the thing is, with, and I know we're kind of running down on time here. I, I wanted to mention a couple of other really big shine moments that he got from the AWA. 
One was back in 1965. Uh, Vern Gagne and the Crusher had won the tag team titles from Larry Hannigan, Harley Race. And then they dropped the titles back to them. This evolved into a six-man tag team match. Hannigan Race chose Chris Markoff as the third man. Vern and Crusher, who would have preferred, as the storyline goes, to wrestle the three of them all by themselves, just two against three, were forced by the AWA to pick a partner. So they went with Kenny J just to have somebody in the corner. Well, that just to have somebody wound up pinning Harley Race for the deciding fall. And we're going to get a quote from Harley here, which is really exemplary about his relationship with Kenny J. But they put Kenny over a future NWA champion clean in the middle of the ring in that six-man tag. And the other one that probably more fans are aware is when Kenny J and George Gadaski teamed up against Adrian Adonis and Jesse Ventura on television. And they gave Kenny the pinfall victory over Adrian Adonis. I believe it was a sunset flip in the second fall of a two out of three fall match, which of course led to Adonis and Ventura going berserk tearing Wally Carbo's jacket, kicking Al Darusha, uh, and being suspended and going to the <laughs> WWF. Um, but that was another moment for Kenny to shine, and he earned it. One thing I got to tell you, enhancement talents are not always recognized by Cauliflower Alley Club. Kenny J was. Uh, he was, was uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame. And what was interesting about it, back then, there were two nights to the Cauliflower reunion. The first night was what they called the Baloney Blowout. Might give a couple of awards out and then more casual. And then the next night is the big, big blockbuster dinner. Well, Kenny, for some reason, thought that he was going to get the award on the first night. Well, Kenny is just all excited. He's The brandies are going one after another. Kenny could barely stand up. And this is this is on Tuesday night. Well, he wasn't going to get his award until Wednesday night. I said, Kenny, I know you're all excited about this. Yeah, give me the award. <laughs> Kenny, Kenny, it, it's tomorrow night. It, it is? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's tomorrow. Kenny. What the hell am I doing here now? Then, I, and, he, and, and of course, with that, he went back to Brandy's. And uh, I, I, I can't, as we wrap it up here, and, and people around the country who don't know, who don't understand why we are paying homage to Kenny J um, in the world of wrestling, where there are all these main event guys. There's main event people in life. Uh, in real life, um, outside of the rest, oh, shit. outside of the wrestling ring, and uh, Kenny J was uh, a main eventer, and uh, I will cherish the memories that I had with Kenny over the years. Nobody has ever treated me as good and with as much kindness as Kenny J did. Uh, I will desperately miss him. Uh, I'm still in touch with his family. His wife, Diana, 59 years uh, they were married. And his daughters and his son and his extended family. A huge loss for everybody. But, uh, oh, man, he's he's something else. And, and Kenny, thank you for the memories. And, and Chris, I know we're going to take it out with uh, a quote from Harley Race. Yeah, we'll uh, we'll go ahead and uh, let's wrap it up on that because you had mentioned that there was something that was put out there by Harley Race and Harley to a man is considered one of the best and toughest of all time. And uh, we're going to go ahead and let's see if I can uh, go ahead and just uh, get that here. Kenny J is the best overall talent in wrestling. He was what we called a job guy or jobber, but he could work with any human being and get a good match out of them. He would go in the ring with a big name who really couldn't do much and make him look good. 
and he could get in there with a Danny Hodge or Vern Gagne and make them look even better than they were. He was just an incredibly talented guy. And that was from Harley Race. And if you get that kind of you get that kind of shine from Harley Race, then you have you have done it right. So um with that, we're just gonna say thank you, Kenny J. Thank you for everything. Um, you're gonna be missed, but you are loved. And uh rest in peace, the capable sodbuster, Kenny J.